Welcome to the Pacific Research Institute's Next Round Podcast. I'm Rowena Ichon, COO, and with me, as always, is Tim Anaya, Vice President of Marketing and Communications. How are you, Tim? I am great. How are you? Fine, thank you. Well, well, we're taping this podcast a little bit early because next week I am attending the Mont Pelerin Society's conference in Bretton Woods. And uh, if our audience, our listeners might remember Bretton Woods from their college days, it was the conference back in 1944, before the end of World War II, was represented by over 40 countries, allied countries uh, worldwide. And and these economists and, and business leaders and, and officials got together to try to establish a, a, a monetary, a world monetary system, international monetary system, so that when the war was over, and back in 1944, it was a kind of sense that they were going to win the war. So they wanted to be able to have in place a, a, a monetary system. And out of that came the, the gold standard. So next year is the 80th anniversary of the Bretton Woods Agreement, Bretton Woods Conference. And so it'll be interesting uh, to to see what you know, economists and and business leaders say now about what's uh, how the eighty years have transpired, and you know what it what's going to happen going forward. And it's kind of scary given that the U.S. has so much debt, and so many other uh, developed countries are also carrying huge debt. Yeah, no kidding. Well, we look forward to your full report when you when you get back. I think it sounds like it'll be a very interesting few days. So, Tim, you've been speaking of world conferences. You've been following our governor's trip to China. You know, last week we teed up a little bit the the governor's uh, uh, trip to China, and uh, you know, one of the big controversies about it was human rights. You know, there are. Um, Obviously, China is not known for its record on human rights, and there are actually Californians who have been held by China for a long time. And it's really the, um, I think it's the obligation of any Californian political leader or U.S. political leader when you have the opportunity to meet with a Chinese leader to raise the issue and press for their release and to press for a better commitment to human rights. And especially, you know, uh, leaders like Newsom and many Democrats stress their commitment to human rights rights in U.S. foreign policy. So Newsom has been on his trip and it's been a uh, kind of a photo op filled trip, as you might imagine, from what we've seen thus far. And the issue of human rights did come up. And interestingly, he brought it up in his meeting with China's foreign minister, Wang Yi, but he did not mention the issue in his meeting with Xi Jinping. And he said when he was pressed by the reporter why he does not, he said, quote, I can't be everything to everybody at every moment of every minute of every day. But I was very privileged to have the opportunity to dialogue with some of the most influential leaders in China about those issues in a very direct and honest way. Well, I think that's a cop out. What are you going to have an opportunity to speak with Xi Jinping again in all that he talks about, he's stressing the morality of the policy agenda that he's pushing. Well, it doesn't get more moral than human rights. And I feel like, um, you know, it really was It was disappointing and a lost opportunity. And it really shows that this trip, it really was all about Newsom setting himself up as someone who could be a, quote, leader on the world stage. But really what you saw is he probably failed in every way as a leader in his one big opportunity on the world stage. I totally agree. There was definitely an an ick factor about all of that. You know, he's out there uh, uh, pretending like he can um, change China's climate change policy. Uh, get them to, you know, reduce methane emissions or or uh, stop building uh, coal fire power plants. But he can't do that as governor. What he can do is to uh, support and try to uh, um, release, have the Chinese government release uh, what, a, a Californian. That's his. Uh, that's his obligation. As a, the, as a governor of California, and it's something that he might actually be able to do something about at the highest levels. So, you know, it, it's sad about this, This uh, I, I think he's from Orange County, this pastor, David Lynn, you know, it sounds like these are trumped up charges. He's been detained for, gosh, I'm, I'm reading here since 2006. It's a very sad situation. And he, uh, governor should have, the governor should have stepped up to the plate. And really all he got out of it is he, he kind of... Ca- 
was used as um, a useful idiot, for lack of a better term, for the Chinese state media. There was glowing coverage of his visit in Chinese state media. And Newsom, of course, doubled down with his obsession on on climate change. But at the end of the day, if um, the person you're meeting with doesn't respect human rights, how's that someone we can do business with on anything? And you something wanna... we, we both talked about in the in the last podcast, which is, you know, is, is Newsom really ready for prime time national stage when he makes kind of mistakes like this? You know, it shows that, yeah, he is an attractive candidate. He's got a good resume, having been governor of California and a mayor and so on and so forth, Got make, has a lot of political backing, can raise a lot of money, but you make, you know, these these really awful statements. I can't be everything everywhere, you know. I mean, really? <laughs> it's it's what it is at the end of the day. He was just happy to have style over substance. He got the picture in the room shaking his hand. That's what that's what he got. That that's really what he wanted out of all of it. So Tim, you want to introduce our next guest? So this is an exciting episode for me. This week we're we're joined by my good friend John Lowry, who's the author of a new book just released called Negotiation Made Simple. And if you want to know anything about, you know, if you think about it, negotiation is something that we do all the time in our regular lives, not just if you're a corporate executive. He really gives you some very good information, practical advice on how to negotiate, how to get the better deal, uh, all of those sorts of things. Um, it's a great how-to guide, even if you don't have any you know, practical experience doing it before. It's a very readable book. And in the interest of full disclosure, I helped him edit the book. So uh, John is someone who um, I've known for decades. Actually, his his wife worked for me when I worked in the legislature. And um, he's a, an attorney. He's a professor. Professor, he's a um, really one of the um, leading negotiators in the country. There, actually, his his business um, he does conflict resolution, and also will teach you how to do conflict resolution. So you really learn from the best of the best. So I think you'll find it very interesting, and also you'll hear. You know, we talk about how do you apply some of the lessons of the book to some of the current disputes that we're all reading about in the news. So I think you'll find it to be a very interesting program. Thanks so much, Jim. I thought it was a really terrific interview and I uh, hope you go out and buy his book. Thank you much, Rowena. I'm excited to be with you all today. John, we're so pleased to have you on next round to talk about your new book, Negotiation Made Simple, which in full disclosure, our Tim and I helped you edit. Uh, it's now available on Amazon.com at your favorite book bookseller. John, you've had a varied career in politics, law, and education, and now you're an author. What are your what was your goal in writing Negotiation Made Simple? And what do you hope readers will learn from your book? Well, I think many people actually negotiate every single day, and many folks don't even realize it. And so I define negotiation as a strategic communication process to get a deal or to solve a problem. And so if we reflect back on life and we think about the amount of time that we spend, both professionally but even personally, engaged in a strategic communication process to get a deal or to solve a problem, what I find is that when I ask that question to large audiences, most of the people will reply back with something like 75% of my time is spent engaged in this process or 100% of my time is spent engaged in this process. And yet, despite using this process to be successful in life, so many people don't see what they do as negotiation. And as a result of that, they don't think about it strategically. They don't have a framework with which to put the negotiation in. And so they're missing opportunities or they're making mistakes. And as a result, their business isn't growing as fast as it could, or that problem that plagues them hangs around when it could be resolved. Uh, they have employees that perhaps aren't as satisfied as they otherwise would be in terms of their leadership and how to negotiate the future for the organization. There's just lots of things that I think people can enjoy more success if they have a sense of the process that will make them successful. And that is the negotiation process, which is why I really wanted to give them a simple framework in this book so that they can become more successful using this process every single day. 
So you start the book with probably my favorite story in the book, which I probably researched more than any other thing we put in the book, which is it's a really simple but powerful story about the old farmer, his neighbor, and a carpenter. I think that says so much about negotiating and what you want to be thinking about. So could you share that story with our listeners? And why do you believe it paints such a, a vivid picture of what all of us, regardless of the complexity of the situation, really will experience when negotiating? Sure. This is a fantastic little story that I first heard probably 20 or 25 years ago. I heard a preacher tell it as part of a sermon. And since then, I read it in some other context, and I've just kind of encountered this story, but you were a great help, Tim, in terms of trying to find the genesis of it, which I don't know if we actually ever did in terms of where it actually originated, but that's true with a lot of great tales, right? We don't know exactly who came up with them, but this story is really powerful because it's a story about two farmers, and these two farmers get into a dispute over a calf. And these two farmers have lived next to each other for years. They've helped each other out. They've been great neighbors. And now all of a sudden, they get into a fight over one particular calf. Both farmers think that this calf is their calf. And as a result of that dispute, they stop talking. And they go for years holding this resentment towards one another. And they have no relationship and they get to the point to where their spouses have passed away and now they're alone and they really do need each other. But because of the dispute, because of the resentment, because of the hostility, they don't even talk. And so finally, in that spirit, here comes this carpenter who is looking for work and he comes upon one of the farmers and he says, is there anything I can do for you? And one of the farmers says, absolutely. And he takes him down to this little creek that divided these two farmers' property. And he asked this carpenter to build a wall so that the separation of these two farms would be final and would be complete. And so the carpenter gets the materials and says that he will go to work on it. And the farmer leaves them and pretty much spends uh, the entire day distracted, doing something else. And finally, he comes back at the end of the day. And this carpenter hasn't built the wall that he's asked. In fact, this carpenter built a bridge across the creek so that this farmer could get to the property of the other farmer. Well, <clears throat> the farmer that asked for the wall to be built was pretty irritated, but as he was expressing his irritation, here comes the other farmer. And the other farmer gets down to this bridge and here they are with this carpenter and the farmer who didn't commission the wall looks over and says, I I'm so glad you built the bridge. Uh, I've been wanting to, to make peace for years and I didn't know how. Thank you for this wonderful gesture of building a bridge. Can we be friends again? And the farmer who commissioned the bridge in that moment can't help but say, sure. And they reconcile and become friends again around this bridge. And so I think about that carpenter. And as I think about that carpenter, I recognize some traits in that carpenter that is really important for negotiators, especially people that are trying to put deals together in a very difficult environment, like a lot of folks in public policy are doing right now in terms of trying to navigate the political landscape and the policy landscape where it's really, really difficult. And so what we learned from this carpenter first is that one, it's going to require people to be bold and to take real leadership. Uh, here, this carpenter, you know, he risked not getting paid that day. Uh, he risked having the carpenter be really angry, but he was bold in terms of his leadership to say, no, let's bring you all together. The next thing is it's going to require a lot of creativity. And so how creative to take all of this lumber and all these materials and say, instead of a wall, let's, let's build a bridge. And the thinking differently there and the creativity in terms of how to bring these farmers together, uh, I think is really, really important. And then finally, that's really what it's all about, is how do we bring people together? Whether it's something as simple as buying a car or it's something as complex as a labor dispute, how is it that 
we as sophisticated negotiators, how is it that we can bring people together so that the deals that need to get done, get done, and people can move on with their lives, hopefully better than when they entered the negotiation. And so I think this carpenter is a model for a lot of us that use this process and for the good that can come from this process if we're bold and we're creative and we stay focused on the people involved. So John, based on your experience as a, as a negotiator for more than two decades, you set forward five strategic skills that you write are, quote, fundamental to becoming a great negotiator and enabling negotiators to deliver outstanding results on a consistent basis. So what are these five key skills and why are they so essential in ensuring good negotiating outcomes on a continual basis? Well, that's a great question. I've tried to boil it down to really just five things. If you're going to take anything at all away from the book, I, I hope you just take these five things because these five things can make all the difference in terms of going from being an unsophisticated negotiator to someone who really has tremendous opportunity to bring in great deals, to advance a business, to push forward an organization, to become a better leader, whatever the case might be. The first is, is that before you think about managing the negotiation process, before you think about managing the other side, uh, before you get to the point of thinking about how to try to manage the outcome of the negotiation, the very first thing that you have to master in managing a negotiation effectively is you have to learn how to manage yourself. Because there are multiple negotiations that go on in a single deal. And I think the negotiation that holds people back the most is actually the negotiation that happens internally. Uh, it's the negotiation that happens between our ears. Uh, it's the negotiation that's within. And really what that negotiation often comes down to is how aggressive or how gracious am I going to be in every move of the negotiation? In other words, how competitive or how cooperative am I going to be at every stage of the negotiation? Where I often see people make mistakes is that they're really cooperative when they actually need to be competitive. Or sometimes it's the, the flip side of that to where they have every opportunity to be cooperative and get everything they want, but they don't know anything different. So they come in competitive. And as a result of that, they blow the whole thing up. And so really the key to negotiation is to know the nature of the game that you're playing, to be able to identify how the other side is playing the game and then to act strategically and to make decisions and to carry out strategies that are going to produce the outcome that you want it to produce. There was a fascinating study that I quote in the book that was done by Harvard. And uh, it really was published by Harvard, but it was done by some professors at several different universities. And they were looking at the opening offer. And usually this is where it, it comes to a point here is where we've got to put a number on the table. And now the question is, how competitive or how cooperative is that number going to be? And what they found was that under almost every study economically, it's proven that the more ambitious you are with the opening number, the better you are going to do. Uh, almost every study supports that. And so this study went further to say, well, then why is it still difficult for people to be really ambitious about their opening offer when they have all the research in the world that says it's real simple, just be more ambitious and you'll get more. Well, the reason is, is because of our own anxiety. Uh, when people make an ambitious opening offer, it's an anxious moment because they don't know what level of tension they will create. They don't know if the other side will get up and walk away. There's all these things they don't know that they perceive as very bad things. And because they don't know how to manage those carefully and strategically, what they do is end up giving a ton of value away before they ever put the first number on the table. Now that's a result of an internal negotiation and that's why I say it's so important to manage yourself. That is the number one thing. 
Number two is what I've already kind of talked about, and that is to know when to cooperate and when to compete. And the way to make that decision is to really evaluate the issue at hand, the substance of the negotiation, but then also the relationship between the parties in the negotiation. And so if the issue is really important, but the relationship is not that important, then you're probably going to have a competitive negotiation. There's no incentive for people to be real cooperative when they don't value the relationship. On the flip side of that, if the relationship is really important, but the issue isn't that important, well, that negotiation is going to naturally lend itself to being something that is more cooperative. And so it's important for us to be able to work through that process and to identify, do we have a competitive or a cooperative negotiation on our hands? that's really going to be driven by not only your behavior, but the behavior of the other person. And to evaluate that behavior and recognize that strategically you want to match that behavior. So if they're gonna be cooperative, keep on being cooperative. Hopefully you all can give enough to be able to get a deal. But if they're gonna be competitive, it's really important that you be competitive as well. Otherwise you make yourself vulnerable to being exploited. So the second thing is you got to know when to cooperate and when to compete. The third thing we've touched on a little bit as well, and that is to recognize that the most important move, especially in competitive negotiation, is the first move. Now, what that means is that may be the first move in the entire negotiation that you decide to make, or it's going to be your response to the other side's first move. But regardless, your first move is critically important in terms of helping to drive the actual outcome. And so with that first move, you want to be as ambitious as you can. Uh, there are limits on what can be done there in terms of starting a productive process. Uh, but the reason that the first move is so important is because it sets expectations it has a lot of signals that are tied to it. And so that first move, that's why it's so influential. It is in fact the most influential moment in the entire process for a negotiator. And many people walk into a negotiation and as they think about the first move, they walk in with a strategy that says, well, let's see what they do, or let's just see what happens, or let's just throw this out to get started. And in doing so, you may get the process started, but you may miss your opportunity for influence, or you may be influenced in the wrong direction. And that happens too often, and I hate to see that. And so the third most important point is to understand that your most important move uh, is the first move. The fourth thing is it's really important to solve problems using empathy and creativity. So empathy is something that I think is kind of new with this book in terms of associating it really closely with negotiation. There's not a lot out there that talks about empathy and negotiation and those kind of processes working together in order to get great deals. But I think empathy is a critically important negotiation skill. And the reason is, is because it gives us an understanding of what the other side is looking for. And that understanding creates the opportunity to be really creative. And so if you apply this to business and you think about businesses that really understand the needs of their customers and are really creative in meeting those needs, you know what we usually call those businesses? Industry leaders <laughs> or Fortune 500. Uh, those businesses are usually really, really successful. And the same is true for negotiators. The more we understand the other side and what it's looking to achieve, and then the more creative we can be in meeting what we want to achieve and what the other side wants to achieve, the better we're going to do. And then the last thing is satisfaction. And Tim, you mentioned uh, satisfaction here just a minute ago. Um, satisfaction uh, I describe satisfaction, and others have described it this way as well, having several different components to it. And in business, we think, and many people think, and I think it's a mistake, to where 
we just have to get the product right, or we just have to get the service right, and the other side will be satisfied. Well, that's one aspect of it is the product or the service and the satisfaction around it. But there's also a component of process. Uh, people are very interested in what is the process that enables me or allows me to engage your product or service. Is it fair? Is it equitable? Is it easy? Uh, all of those considerations are really important for people and how the deals get put together. And then lastly, and perhaps more important, is the people component of satisfaction. And so people, product, and then process. I say the people component is the most important because, again, there's a lot of research that suggests that when people are making decisions, the most important thing that will drive that decision is not analysis. It's emotion. And what drives the emotion is actually ego. And so people are making very significant decisions based on their own emotions and their own ego. It's, it's a people thing, uh, more than it is a process or a product thing. And so a really good deal is going to be a deal that creates satisfaction with the product, the process, and most importantly, the people. So let's drill down a little bit on your, your first point. You, know, you have a great quote in your book from Dwayne The Rock Johnson, who says, success starts with you. And, you know, really, if you think about it, and as you make the case in your book, you know, really, one of the only things you really can control in a negotiation is yourself. So what are some tips you have for our listeners, how they can manage themselves in a negotiation? And how can people focus and think in a way that, will really position themselves for a successful outcome? Excellent question. So it takes me back to something I learned in undergraduate when I was studying rhetoric and communication. And you spend a lot of time reading Greek philosophers. And I forgot which philosopher it was, but one of them said that really the essence of all education is to know thyself. And I think that's a really important starting point for negotiators is to know themselves. And so the reason that that's important is because as we understand our strengths and we understand our weaknesses, it gives us an opportunity to manage them. If we're not very good at taking on people that are highly aggressive and highly combative, if we find ourselves in a negotiation with that kind of person, that may not be a game we want to play. We may need a colleague to come in to take that person head on. Uh, the other thing that's really important about knowing yourself is it also helps you identify how to push the conversation and how to use your strengths to guide the conversation and how to shield some of those weaknesses, perhaps. And so I think the first thing is we've got to know ourselves. Secondly, we have to be real. And so sometimes we, we, we live in la-la land uh, in terms of thinking about reality. And we make assumptions that are nowhere close to being reality. And yet through that, mm -hmm. develop a decision-making process. And then as we get into the negotiation process and as those assumptions get challenged, or as we have people that are seeking to extract value from us, we find ourselves really having a difficult time because we haven't built a realistic foundation on which to try to create a deal. And so testing your assumptions is really, really important. Uh, the next thing I would say is knowledge. You want to have knowledge of the substance and what you're negotiating. And that's something you can totally control. And so you want to make sure you know what you're talking about. You want to make sure you know the essence of the deal you're trying to put together if it's in sales or business, you wanna know what the market is. If it's in politics, you wanna know what the political landscape is. And all of those things will inform not only the substance of the deal that gets put together, but how to put together, how to put it together as well. And so as we think about managing ourselves, there's a lot that goes into that that has to happen long before the process ever starts. And some of it we have to continuously work on in terms of understanding ourselves, understanding our perspective, knowing the kinds of behaviors that will be constructive toward putting this deal together, 
or knowing where we have limitations and how do we keep those limitations from being exploited in this process, those are all really, really important things to manage as we manage ourselves. And in the book, um, I lay out ways and some frameworks for people to do this in terms of taking an inventory of how ready you are for a negotiation and taking an inventory for where you are in terms of your negotiation skills. Because by doing that, you'll take that knowledge and you'll be able to make really good decisions about how to engage this process in a way in which you can win and be successful. So, Joan, one of the key reasons why people can get hosed in negotiations is that they don't view it as a competitive exercise. Many people are uncomfortable being competitive, even when it's in their own best interest. So you argue that regardless of what you're haggling over, competitive negotiations are actually rather predictable. Talk about this and, and what are some of the common characteristics of competitive negotiations and, and how can people use this predictability to, to their advantage? Yeah, the predictability of competitive negotiation is actually your best friend. Uh, it's a guide through the entire process. And so here's how it sets up. It's really uh, kind of simple. And so if we think about just the process, what we know about competitive negotiations is that uh, it is going to be, it's going to be built off of a fixed pie. And what I mean by that is um, there's, there's an assumption that there's only so much value to go around, uh, that value is not unlimited. And so if we're two companies doing business, there's only so much that the company that's buying the product or service can pay for it. And so the reality is, though, is that the company that's selling it wants it for as much as wants as much as possible for it. And the company that's acquiring it wants to pay as little as possible. And so what that usually does is it creates a gap. And to solve that gap, it's going to be what I call a zero sum exchange, which means that whatever one side wins, the other side must lose and vice versa. This is how the whole concession process works in working through a negotiation. Now, what's interesting is in order for there to be a deal, there's going to have to be a series of compromises. That's just very predictable. If there's no compromise, there won't be a deal. But what gets interesting is the predictability is not just around the process, but it's also around the substance. And so what we know is that as negotiations proceed, the substance gets less, but each move is harder to achieve because as people begin to run out of value, they hold on to it tighter and they don't want to give it. And so it takes longer. It's harder. This is where tension begins to mount in this process. And yet that is something that is just very, very predictable. And so at the beginning of a negotiation, we're exchanging a ton of value thousands of dollars, perhaps millions of dollars, perhaps. But then when we get to the end, we may be fighting over a tiny amount of money in comparison to where we started. And yet getting those last concessions can be really, really difficult. Now, the most fascinating piece of all of this is that the end is also pretty predictable. And what we know is that a negotiation usually will end at the midpoint of kind of the first two reasonable offers. That's not a formula that's set in stone, but it is pretty predictable. And so I can sit down and with two parties and say, okay, where's this party? Where's that party? Is that reasonable? Is this reasonable? And if it is, you can almost nail it to say at the end of the day, here's about where we're going to finish. And are we good with that or not? And it's amazing how it does become pretty predictable. The other thing that's very predictable that people need to keep in mind, and this is really, really hard for folks because our time is so valuable and people are so busy, and that is you cannot short circuit the dance. Uh, there's a ritual to all of this. And so if you look at, at some events that and things that are taking place in the world out there, you know, some people wonder, can't they figure this out? And the reality is, and maybe we'll talk about some of those, but the reality is, is that in some cases, the answer is no. You got to let the process play out to get people to a place to where they can ultimately say yes. And so competitive negotiation 
is extremely predictable. But here's the interesting thing about competitive negotiation is while it gets coined as being competitive, there is an element of it that's cooperative. And the element of it that's cooperative has to do with psychology. And so in a competitive negotiation, many times there's that moment where you say, no, I can't do any more. Or no, I'm not going to pay any more for this product or service. Or you say, no, I'm not going to vote for your particular piece of legislation or I'm not gonna support it, whatever the case might be. It's in that moment to where if you've worked this process and you've gotten this process towards the end, it's that moment that provides psychological satisfaction for the other side. Because when you say no, it gives the other side the message that they've gotten all they can get in the deal. And for some negotiators, that's what they're looking for, is just the absolute best deal. And so when someone says no, that's the signal that you've gotten the absolute best deal. And even though you say no and hold on to value, it's actually a cooperative gesture to the other side to give them that psychological win that they're looking for. Let's talk a little bit more about the, the concept of satisfaction. You know, you write in the book that it's through satisfaction that you'll be able to build lasting relationships, loyal customers, and a positive reputation, both personally and professionally. So share with our listeners um, your thoughts on the importance of satisfaction to successful negotiation, and what are a few steps they can take to deliver satisfying outcomes, hopefully for all in negotiations? Well, the first thing, Tim, is to make sure that you don't make the mistake in assuming, in assuming it's all about the product or service. And so it's critical that people understand that, that triangle of satisfaction, that process, people, product component of it. And to recognize that you do have to create satisfaction in the product or the service. Uh, whatever it is that you say you're going to deliver, you've got to deliver it. Otherwise, you're not going to be successful in this world. But also understand that as you work hard to deliver an outstanding product or service, the reality is, is that there are components of that in which you have no control. And so to deliver it 100% of the time is very difficult. And so for you all hosting this podcast, I'm just going to guess that somewhere along the way in the production of this outstanding podcast, there has been a technical glitch. Uh, there has been perhaps someone that said something that created a challenge um, or whatever the case might be. Despite all of your efforts, all of the preparation, all of the tools, the reality is, is that sometimes the product isn't what we envision it to be. And so in those moments, and here is the big opportunity for people, I think, in all industries, all walks of life, in those moments, your only chance to deliver satisfaction is with the process and with the people. And so that's where I see a lot of leaders going. That's where I see a lot of businesses going, a lot of organizations going, is they're beginning to understand that if they use really sophisticated and strategic processes in which to deliver their product, to engage their customers or their clients, if they use really good processes, and then within the context of those processes, if they treat people really, really well, they will be forgiven in the moments where the product isn't exactly what they want it to be. Uh, but what they also understand is they also understand the business that they are in. And so if you think about some companies out there, and you guys are on the West Coast, so I use a couple of West Coast examples. Uh, but if you take Nike, for example, big company based in Beaverton, Oregon, we all know Nike for its athletic apparel and its athletic equipment, multi-gazillion dollars. Phil Knight has built an absolutely outstanding company. And yet, if you think about the business that Nike is in, 
it, it would be really easy for people to say, well, that's easy. They're an athletic apparel company. And that would be probably the sector that we would place them in. But if you really explore what Nike's all about, it, it isn't really athletic apparel. They put their athletic apparel in the middle of something that's bigger. And so this idea of just do it, it's inspirational. That's what Nike's getting it to. Or it's association. Think about Nike's taglines. They engaged Michael Jordan and they did a whole campaign on which they built the company that said, be like Mike. And yet so many of us, including me, I've bought several pairs of Air Jordans and guess what? I still don't play basketball like Michael Jordan. Uh, it doesn't work. Uh, you can't buy a pair of Air Jordans and all of a sudden become Michael Jordan. And yet, you know what I'll do when I wear these out? I'll go buy another pair and try it again. Uh, because what Nike has done so brilliantly is put their product in the middle of something that people are trying to achieve that has a much more... <laughs> what Nike has done that is so brilliant is put their product in the middle of something that people are trying to achieve. Whether it's running that marathon or winning that state championship or elevating your game to a certain level, what Nike has said is, this is the athletic apparel you want to be wearing to accomplish what you're looking to accomplish. And so what Nike understands is it's not all about the athletic apparel and the technical components of the product. When you buy a pair of Nike shoes, you don't get all the specs on the box in terms of how much rubber is in the shoe versus how much leather and where it comes from and how it's made. You don't get any of that on the box. Um, you just get a swoosh and maybe a just do it. Uh, you get the inspiration component because Nike knows it's not all about the product. It's all about the process and it's about the people that are buying the shoe. And so really good organizations are starting to appreciate that. And as a result of that, they're understanding how it is that they can achieve satisfaction. And what happens when you achieve satisfaction is you get durable agreements or you get longstanding relationships. And that's great for business. That's great for the public sector. Uh, that's great for getting things done that are good in the world. Another mega negotiation that is playing out in the news every day is, is a labor dispute between Hollywood Studios and, and the Screen Actors Guild. Even though the studios settled their labor dispute with the Writers Guild, negotiations have recently broke down seemingly over a lack of trust. So based on what you cover in your book, what piece of advice would you give to both the studios and the actors to, to try and gain the upper hand and win a favorable resolution to their side? What are some of the tasks tactics to, tr to try and work out through these differences um, when the, a lack of trust appears to be the biggest divide between the two sides? So trust is a really interesting thing. I have a formula for trust that I didn't necessarily make up. I got it somewhere, but I use it all the time in just my, my leadership and my negotiations. And th that formula is this. It's Credibility plus reliability plus likability divided by self-interest. And so as we think about trust and in the context of this negotiation where both sides have kind of lost trust in each other, we know where the problem is. Uh, they either don't have any credibility with each other or they don't feel like the other side is reliable. Uh, and it may be such that they just don't like each other. Um, and yet the denominator around all of that is this whole idea of their own self-interest. I think if you're looking to solve this and overcome a lack of trust, then you got to allow for the top three things to really come to play. The easiest one to correct, ironically, is actually likability. Um, to where if you can get the parties communicating in a constructive way, it is going to increase likability. 
as you increase likability, then there is the opportunity to demonstrate some reliability, uh, to begin to build some of that. If we say we're going to do it, we're going to do it. And then from there, there comes the credibility in terms of the other side. And so there's a quick little formula in terms of how to try to put this thing back together. It doesn't happen very fast, but that's the way in which it needs to happen for both sides to have a productive relationship going forward. And then at some point in this process, and this is where the concessions will come in, they will have to slowly begin to put aside their self-interest and as they put aside their self-interest, they will make concessions and they will finally get to a point to where they strike a deal and move forward. And so a lack of trust, one of the things that's really helpful to me is it's easy to identify a lack of trust, but it's really difficult to identify what the source of that lack of trust is and then how to fix a lack of trust. Uh, those are difficult things for me. And so this formula has been really, really helpful. And I think can be useful in this case too, in terms of giving people a sense of how trust can reemerge in such a way that these two sides can strike a deal and start making movies and television shows again. So finally, John, our favorite question, we, we call our podcast next round because of PRI's proximity to wine country and our love of discussing politics and policy and great books over a glass of California wine. So what wine or beer or cocktail or other beverage are you enjoying today to celebrate the publication of your terrific new book? Well, I do love a California wine, but I'm from Tennessee now. Uh, so I'm going to give you a Tennessee wine, if that's okay. And the, the Tennessee wine that I enjoy is actually a blend. It's called Red Fox Red, and it's produced by Arrington Vineyards, which is a small little vineyard south of Nashville. And the owner of Arrington Vineyards is someone that people will know. Uh, the owner is Kix Brooks of the famous country music duo Brooks and Dunn. And so Kix is a, a wonderful guy. Uh, he's done an outstanding job in terms of taking a hillside in Arrington where his vineyard is and turning it into a venue that attracts hundreds and hundreds of people on the weekends that come and listen to live music and drink his different wines. But the Red Fox Red is my absolute favorite. And I encourage people to go check it out and uh, order it from Arrington Vineyards uh, right here outside of Nashville, Tennessee. And I can attest because John has taken me to Arrington Vineyards and we have enjoyed a bottle or three of Red Fox Red and it is quite good. Thanks so much, John, and good luck on your book. If you like this episode, please tell your friends and subscribe to PRI's podcast at iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeartRadio, and Spotify. And when you're on these platforms, don't forget to give us a big five stars. If you don't subscribe to any of these, you can still listen on PRI's YouTube page, youtube.com slash Pacific Research One. That's the number one. Thanks for listening. I'm Rowena Ichon. Hope you'll come back again for next round with PRI.